morning, everyone. I'm glad you made it here in this. It's going to be another virtual day, so I can see why some people did not make it. Um, so yes, as um, Robert said, I'm going to talk about persuasion and how it can go wrong. So I'm going to basically talk about a couple of persuasion tools. These are not all the persuasion tools that we have available, but some of them. And one is the framing. And the other one is especially balance framing, because framing can be uh, studied in many different ways. I'm going to talk about balance framing, which is you know, positive, negative gains, losses. And then also emotional appeals, that is positive emotions and negative emotions and how that can affect persuasion. And then we're going to go and see how that can turn into going wrong, either with no effects or boomerang, meaning coming back to you and making it worse. And also we're going to analyze some of the theories that explain these effects. Um, so I'm going to do it obviously applied to health communication, but many of these results can be applied to many other uh, realms, such as political communication or kids and media, etc. So most of the health messages uh, that are in the literature are designed to mainly accomplish uh, four goals. Increase awareness about an issue, uh, change the attitudes about an issue, prevent certain behaviors such as eating badly or starting smoking, starting drugs, um, and changing behaviors. So stopping smoking, um, making you exercise more, um, stop, um, I don't know, stop uh, sunbathing, etc., etc. So, some of the persuasion tools that we have in order to accomplish these um, awareness, changing attitudes, prevention behaviors, and changes in behaviors is balance framing. And I take the definition that um, Levin uh, and um, et al. in a very landmark like, article in 98 kind of made sense of the balance framing literature, which, you know, as most of the times when somebody tries to make sense of it is because there were different results and they couldn't explain it. Sometimes one type of framing was better at persuasion, sometimes another type of framing was better at persuasion, and so they couldn't understand it. So in order to kind of make sense of it, they designed a category categorizing balance framing. And one of the first categories was risky choice framing. How many of you have heard of that? Risky choice framing. Chairman trustee. Nobel Prize winner in the Are you? Was it saying fear-based kind of frame? No, no. It's a choice of two sets depending on whether it's framed as a losses or as gains. So suppose you are an almighty, meaning just the president, that has to design a plan, a plan to save people from a coming pandemic. And so if I frame the issue in terms of gains, I'd say with plan A, 200 people will be saved. With plan B, there is a third probability that 600 people will be saved, and a two-thirds probability that no people are going to be saved. Not at all. Now, let's do some probability theory. What is the expected value of plan A? 200 people saved. What is the expected value of plan B? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. 200 people say. Now raise your hands. How many would choose plan A? Raise your hands. Come on, don't be shy. How many people would choose plan B? Come on. Exactly what the theory predicts. People prefer to choose things that are sure. So people are risk averse when it comes to gains, right? Now let's change the things. Now I'm going to frame it in terms of losses. So plan A, 400 people will die for sure. Plan B, a third of the people, um, oops, a third of nobody, no, will die. And two of the, OK. All right, I, that was a mistake. A third of the people will not die, hmm. and two-thirds of the people will die. So expected value of the first one, 400 people will die, and expected value of the second one, 
How many people would choose plan A? Raise your hands. How many people would choose plan B? Raise your hands. Exactly what the theory predicts. When it comes to losses, people are risk-seeking. So, this is again, and this is a value function. I had to show you these, you guys. I have to show you some of that. So, see, whoops, there, it doesn't show on the screen. But when it comes to gaze, the function is concave. When it comes to losses, the function is convex. And this, the, uh, the step of the curve here is lower and this is higher. So normally losses, they say, loom larger than gains. Right? So when it comes to gains, we don't want to take risks. When it comes to losses, we want to take risks. So we do want people to take risks. Frame the issue in terms of losses. Okay? This is one type of framing, balance framing. The other type of balance framing is what's called attribute framing. And what is this? Well, it's the typical the glass is half full, half empty kind of thing, right? So it's mostly used for products. So here's one product. What's that? Hamburger. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Right? <coughs> now, when are you going to be more likely to buy ground beef? When I tell you that it's 95% lean or 5% fat? Who's going to buy the product if I tell you 5% fat? <laughs> the Japanese, actually. <laughs> what about if I tell you 9% lean and 5% lean? More people are going to buy the product if I tell you 95% lean. More people buy products if they are framed in terms of gains, in terms of you know positively than if they're you know framed negatively or in terms of losses. And then the final um, type of balance framing, which is called goal framing. Goal framing because both the loss and the gain frame have the same goal, but the stress is different. So the goal is the same. Press self-examination. Go and take a colonoscopy. Um, go and take any other type of screens, like, you know, pap smear. The goal is the same, but you frame it differently. Let's see an example. So, if you go, your life might be saved. If you don't go, your life might be lost. The goal is the same, to save the life but you frame it differently. Now, who is gonna go for a colonoscopy? I don't know, this is a bad audience to test me with. But, just imagine you are, I don't know, over 70, or no, what is the population when it started? 50. 50. Just imagine this. <laughs> it was not fun. If you go, your life might be, might be safe. How many of you would go with that? If you don't go, your life might be lost. How many would go with that? Exactly as the theory predicts. If you, fra if you frame it in terms of losses, people are going to be more willing to go to a colonoscopy. Victor. But because of the framing, uh, if you frame it the second way, uh -huh. isn't that a little bit poetic? Because you kind of force the other guy to actually go and have a colonoscopy. Well, it's, it's the same, it's also coercive too. It's the same. It's just that it's, it's more impactful when it's negative. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to have people go to a colonoscopy, frame it in terms of losses. Okay, so according to Levin, uh, and I'm looking on the middle author, uh, Schneider and Gaia, in their 1998 article, we have risky choice framing, attribute framing, and goal framing. And depending on which one it is, one frame is more persuasive than the other. So we can't say gains is always more persuasive than losses or vice versa. It depends on the type of balance framing. Now, when it comes to emotions, we can have kind of a little bit, we can classify them so of positive and negative emotions. And one of the positive emotions is happiness. And where do we see happiness? In what kind of advertising do we see happiness? 
things that's going to happen to you if you do it, which is like, why should I take this? If I'm going to die, I'm going to have the suicide thoughts, and my blood pressure is going to skyrocket. Why do you want to do this? It's because it's, you know, according to the law, you know, you have to tell the side effects if you tell all the good properties of the product. But if you don't say anything, then you don't have to say the, any of the side effects. And so you have these drug ads that you don't know what they're for, but you see happy people over there, and then you have to figure out what it is for. And that's because, you know, they don't tell you what it's for, they don't have to tell you what it's going to do bad for you. So the side effects. So for instance, this act, what is it for? Mailing. It's the, it's the mailing. Yeah, thank you. I'm just trying to find I had to say something like that with so much testosterone here. Yeah. So, yes, happiness. Oh, I'm going to buy it because I'm going to feel so happy. Right? <laughs> so when it comes to drugs, you want, <laughs> you want to have happiness. You want to have positives. You know, if you show people like all the negatives, nobody's going to buy it, right? Now, when it comes to negative emotions, one of the negative emotions that's been studied is fear. You know, getting scared. What is called fear appeals the of people. Now, <clears throat> Weedy in 1992 designed one of the, in my opinion, best, um, most elegant models of, of most elegant theories, the extended parallel process model. Again, trying to make sense of the literature. He found that sometimes fear appeals were effective and people reacted to it, so you scare people off and they, yes, they go and get a colonoscopy or they go and uh, gets green or they stop smoking, but other times you scare people off and they don't do anything. And sometimes, even worse, they do it more. So he was like, we have to make sense um, of what's going on with fear. And so what he did, uh, I'll show you the model later, but I'll just show you now an ad. Um, click here. And I'd like to ask how many of you think this is fearful or not. That is this is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Okay, so. <laughs> it made you hungry. Good, good answer. What else? Did it scare you? Well, now we're now we think it's funny. But at the time, I mean, I was a little kid when this came out. Was anyone else younger? Like, yes, girl. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not So these kids. I get it now. <laughs> Did it scare you by then? I mean, yeah, I think yeah. Well, I was also like five, so okay. I mean, a lot of things scared me at five. Okay. So okay. Well, what we did is, is designing this kind of really cool model in which it explains all the different outcomes. So you have three outcomes at the end. You have disregard, the fear control, and danger control. So here you have no effects, here you have boomerang, and here you have the desired effect. And so what determines this is, first of all, the level of fear in the message, the threat, right? So you have message with high threat and message with low threat, depending on how much you put the volume on fear. Now, depending on your level of efficacy, and efficacy is the ability of people, the, the perceived ability or your perceived ability on whether you can do or not something. So I can run 10 <laughs> miles every day, or I think I can do it. You know, I can go to the gym every week, or Oh, yeah, forget it. So it's our perceived level of whether we can do or not things. Now, some people are high in efficacy on a particular issue, and others are not. 
So this is your perceive, your, you know, when you look at yourself and say, or yes, I can do it. Think about Nike, I can do it. The Nike is pushing on the efficacy. And so depending on your ethic level of uh, perceived efficacy is high or low, this is high, this is low, the outcomes might differ. So this is a combination of threat in the message, fear appeals, and efficacy. Two different values, I, variables, that he combined to explain the different effects. So again, if the message, the threat of the message is low, nothing happens. Just in process. Nothing happens. It doesn't really matter whether you have high efficacy or low efficacy, you know, it just, nothing happens. If you don't scare people enough, nothing's going to happen. Molly? Yes. Going back to the Friday, uh -huh. I was a little kid when this came out, so I remember there was, there was always this, uh -huh. this uh, phrase that this, this person has been taking drugs and his brain is fried. Uh -huh. And so that commercial really built upon the catchphrase uh -huh. of the society at that time uh -huh. and sort of brought it to a physical reality. Here is something getting fried and uh -huh. this could be your brain. So uh -huh. there was a really strong connection between the vernacular about uh -huh. drugs and this particular commercial. Yeah, so it did scare you. It, it, no, it didn't really scare me, but it, I, I understood what they were doing and I understood the, 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 uh, the side effects of, of yeah, taking drugs. Yeah, and the connection was so very well quit? done. Did you quit taking drugs? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. But now think about it, who was the target population of this ad? We are on camera. <laughs> <laughs> who was the target population of those ads? Teenagers. Teenagers, right? So I don't know whether teenagers made the connection uh. and or whether they felt scared. Probably not. Because the level of fear in these messages was just right not there. Yes? Could be a third consequence like maybe someone really likes fried eggs and so on? Yeah, and we'll look at that too. Yes, 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 yes. There can be more things going wrong other than, than the fear. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and all these are variables too, right? I'm sure it affected a percentage of people who want to make it a high percentage, but it's a variable. It's not yeah, a maybe for some people it scared them enough. So maybe for some people they were here. But for most people, because the level was low, was here. But for some, maybe it was here. Now, when you get scared, you get scared. You see a bear coming, and you get scared. There's two things you can do, right? You can freak out, or you can say, okay, I can do it. Just let's think. Let's think. What can I do? You know, can I move? Can I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what I can do there. But there's, I'm sure there's something that you could think about doing. And it all depends on your level of efficacy. Whether you go and see, I can do this. I can beat this bear, or where you can go and freak out. If you go and freak out, you do, and you take this path, which is called fear control, which I call the freaking out path, right? Instead of trying to avert the threat, you are too busy with the fears to freak out. But if you have a call head, you have a high level of efficacy, and say, no, I can beat this fear, you know, and think about it, you go into danger control. Look at the words danger and fear. Danger is cognitive, fear is emotional. You switch. You kind of beat the fear and say, no, I'm going to take care of it. So, three outcomes when it comes to fear and efficacy no effects, boomerang, and desired effect. Okay? And now let's see another ad in which you tell me what is the things that have been changed compared to the other one. This is your brain. This is heroin. This is what happens to your brain after snorting heroin. And this is what your body goes through. It's not over yet. This is what your family goes through. And your friends and your mom. Any questions? So what is the change here compared to the other one? 
is a hot woman. <laughs> Famous ones. Could be. It's more threat, more obvious threat. The level of fear has gone up, right? So as to get us away from this path. To get us away from this path and move us here. But beware, for some it might work, for others it might not work. All right, so let's recap on persuasion tools. We have balance framing can be very persuasive, and we have emotional appeal. So just with, with here, you start realizing that persuasion can fail. Legal? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Molly. Um, keep going through that. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> uh, that commercial, though, um, everybody would, be, would tell you this is what happens when you take heroin. Uh -huh. And there isn't a, uh, a visual or an emotional connection to the words. Uh -huh. But this advertisement brings an emotional and visual connection to, as a metaphor to what happens. Uh -huh. and, and that must have some kind of power, not just fear, but it has some sort of power to have someone realize, oh, this is how chaotic mm -hmm. it can get. That's for those who think. Now, most of us don't. We are cognitive minders, and if we can avoid it, we won't think. So we always kind of take shortcuts, you know, around thinking, right? And so we get that's why stereotypes are so hot because that you know why they're thinking. You see, something's odd. This guy might be lazy. Odd. This guy might be whatever. Um, and so for those people, then emotions are more powerful because if you start thinking. You always kind of can put down one. You can, if you think coolness, you always can put down your emotions for one, and you can see more sides of an issue, etc., etc., etc. But that's typically not the case for most of us. When did the second half come out versus the first? Oh, and, and is there, I, I don't have an answer. I was wondering in relation to when this work was published. Uh huh. Uh, I'll look it up though. So much later. Yeah. yeah, I knew it was later, but I didn't know how much. Um, okay, so understanding how these mechanisms can fail, it can help us avoid it happening again, right? Because we know that sometimes things don't work. We have a lot of campaigns that haven't worked. And I'm, I'm thinking about social campaigns, not uh, marketing campaigns, but product marketing campaigns. So many times don't work. And though we go home and it's like, why didn't it work? You know? So understanding why it doesn't work can be very helpful in making us avoid these mistakes when we design campaigns. Like you're gonna do something. No, most of it. Okay, so what is a persuasion fails? Well, um, we have positive health behavior, behaviors, and we try to modify, but what happens? More people smoke, more people consume drugs, more people, people are more likely to use drugs, uh, there is a decrease in healthy behaviors and or suicide risk. Um, in the entertainment education, what happens is that it can, it can reinforce stereotypes and increase rape myth beliefs. Um, and in some strategic, strategic effort, efforts to reduce the kind of the bad effects of the media, sort of media literacy intervention, or the ratings on movies, which are designed, you know, supposedly to so that kids are not exposed to more sex and violence, but you know. Uh, so there's certain things that certain people deem um, not desirable. Uh, warnings on TV. Um, and TV co-viewing with children, which they say, you know, if you watch uh, movies or you watch television with your kids, you know, the bad effects of watching TV are not that bad. But sometimes, you know, it can boomerang. It can make them more um, hungry for, for a program or for movies or for ads, etc., etc., etc. So these are examples, some of the examples in which things have gone wrong. So some of the theoretical explanations um, that have been collected in the, in the literature are uh, psychological reactance, commodity valuation, ironic process theory, engaging in fear control, which we have seen, um, observational learning, priming and accessibility, social cognitive theory, internalizing attributions, ambiguity reduction, peripheral processing and social norms. Long list of ways in which whoops, theories that explain why there is a around. One of the best 
uh, and I don't know why the author doesn't show up. One of the best classifications of these is by Bernard Hart. I think it's a 2009 article in which they're trying to make sense of these different explanations. And um, one of the, the, the classifications is between intended and unintended construct. Now, these are all unintended effects. These are all theories that explain unintended effects. But they are based on whether they activate the intended constructs and the unintended constructs. The construct of a message is the parts of the message. So say you have a television ad. So you have um, maybe um, celebrities. What kind of people show me? Are they tall? Are they thin? Are they, are they African American? Are they Hispanic? Um, are they fat? Are they um, bold? Are they blonde? Whatever. These are all the attributions and the elements of the message. How are they voices? Do they scream? Do they whisper? What kind of tone? What kind of colors are in the message? What kind of um, products are in the message? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It's easier if it's only text, right? Because you have words and that's it. When you have an image, you have, you suddenly have a lot of things to control. And when you have, you know, video, when you have an ad on television, it's even more things to control. And we nowadays still struggling to make sense of how to classify what are the things that, you know, activate certain things and not others. So it, it just gets more complicated. Now, of these constructs, there are some constructs that we intend for people to pay attention. So if we see um, um, you wanting to stop smoking, um, we might have like a really, you know, exaggerated thin person that is like really like pale and kind of coughing, and maybe that person has a cigarette in the hand. And what we want to, you know, activate is that this person is having a bad time, right? We want the people to pay attention to this, but because there is a cigarette, because that person is smoking a cigarette, some people might get cravings. And so that would be an unintended activation. We don't intend for people to get cravings. And that's, for instance, why many times when there are anti-smoking ads, you don't see a cigarette because they know that it can activate things that we don't want to, right? It's very easy to have a cigarette there because you kind of want to see this is, this is what happens when you smoke. But what happens is that some people may use that as an activation for something else. So the intended construct is like the sickness the maybe you see, I don't know, maybe you see that oh, it's really hard, you know. These are all the things that you want the people to, you know, to, to process in the message. And when that happens, you still, things can still go wrong. So let me say it again. These are all theories that explain things that go wrong. So everything goes wrong here. Nothing goes right, okay? But some, some explanations come from the activation of the intended construct in the message. Others from, come from the activation of the unintended construct. So for instance, for instance, the one that we have seen, the EPPM, what is the intended construct of the message? Let's take the M, the second M. What are some of the intended constructs in that message? Right. Right. Yes. Broader ramifications of what happens when you take drugs. Things get smashed everywhere. The kitchen is a mess. Everything is smashed. And what are some of the unintended things? Well, you don't see a fire here. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of a fire egg. I, I don't think anybody cares. So, seeing a fire egg and thinking about food, what's that? An unintended construct, right? Or, we or, don't want. Or like Andrew pointed out, there's a hot girl. In a hot girl in there, and I'm like, whoa, maybe if I do drugs, I can get hot girls. Yeah. Right? Uh, totally unintended. That's not what we want to. Uh, okay. yeah, a lot of people don't understand what you just said. And I don't mean this room, what you said. Uh -huh. But I remember seeing 
there was a there was a political commercial where this guy's political director was smoking and talking about it, and everybody went crazy that they made uh, this commercial with him smoking. Say, what are you putting this person on TV smoking? Uh -huh. They don't understand the unintended consequences that you're talking about now. That uh -huh. smoking can cause people seeing someone smoke can do more things than say vote for Joe. It's also say go out and have a cigarette. Yes, and that's why they banned. Haven't they banned uh, cigarettes in movies or in certain? Yeah. I don't know in movies. Sorry. Maybe not in movies, but then the movies rated whatever R or something. But in television, you know, and that's why. You know, some people say, but some people smoke, so we want to, you know, we want to portray that in the movie or in the series. Yes, but if you show cigarettes and people smoking, it, it can activate certain things in some people, not everyone. <coughs> you know, and that's not good, right? So. Um, one of the main um, theoretical explanations for unintended effects is psychological reactions. And I wish um, Stalin was here, because I'm sure he, of course, he knows about this. So psychological reactance uh, explains what happens when uh, people's freedoms are threatened or eliminated. Now, we're not talking about the religious <coughs> notion of freedom, you know, you know we're free. And, that's not. So let's put a, a specific example. For example, smoking. You are free to smoke, right? If you are a certain age, if you age 18, if you're 18, you can just go to the store and buy a pack of cigarettes. You know, it's not illegal. You can't do it. That's your freedom. If an app goes and tells you, don't smoke, you're free to smoke. Right? So what happens in this case is when your freedom is threatened or eliminated, what you want to do is you, you want to restore it. You want to go back to where you were. And what do you do? Well, you just do the thing. What else? Well, sometimes you go like the other way. You, you become more ingrained with it. So um, for example, when workspaces go smoke free, you'll still see the smokers outside, like, I'm gonna smoke more than, it's almost this, no, I'm gonna smoke just to prove I can smoke, even yeah. though they may have been thinking, like, of quitting it. So it's more of a, just like, okay, now it's become a rights issue, so yeah. like, screw you. Yeah, who well, are well, you to tell me not to smoke? Yeah, so another example is, um, adolescents that have asthma are gonna make a point of going out and smoking, because they're gonna say, I don't have trouble breathing. I'm going to show everyone that I don't have trouble breathing. Exactly. I'm going to smoke, make sure other people see that I'm smoking so they don't think I have a breathing issue. Exactly, exactly. So it's this kind of, I want to restore. So you have more thoughts. You dismiss the source. So many times it's like, you know, especially this is really, you know, you have teenagers. I don't, but I almost, you know, I have almost as if I have teenagers, you know. When you, you tell them, don't do that, you know, they tell you, I hate you, I don't like you, you know. <laughs> what they do, what they're doing is dismissing the thoughts. So some of the things that the reactance explains is kind of the, some of the behaviors that you do to restore your freedom. But this doesn't apply to everything. For example, you couldn't use this kind of advertising for a colonoscopy. No. Say, I'm going to go get a colonoscopy because they said exactly. they won't. Exactly. No, 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 no. Exactly. This One of is, it, it all depends on what type of behavior we want, we want to change and whether we want. So, first of all, what are the goals of our campaign? We want to increase awareness. You know, increasing awareness is kind of easier than changing a behavior. Changing a behavior is really hard. You know, you cannot, you cannot show old tricks, no new tricks to an old dog, which is really hard. Changing people's behaviors is hard. It might take a generation or two. Now, awareness is another thing, you know, because then people can learn really easy. They don't, they're not going to change the behavior, but they, it's right there, you know. So next time you go and try to go and change attitudes, it's going to be easier if there is awareness. So we have awareness, attitudes, prevention behaviors, and changing behaviors. So from easier to different. And also, it depends on the audiences. So if you're dealing with teenagers, teenagers are the hardest because they are kind of assuring their self, you know, their sense of self. And you have to be really, really careful not to push them because they're going to say, "No, I'm just going to do the opposite of what you're saying." You know, children are a little easier, like small children, not preteens. Um, 
older people might be hard because it's like I've done it all my life. I'm going to want to, you know, you have to really convince them. Look at the doctor saying, you don't get this colonoscopy, you know, you, you know, you might die. Or if you don't get these, you know, um, cancer treatment, you know, you might die. You know, because they, they, they see their end of the, you know, just what's going to be, what's going to do to me. So it depends on the population and also within the population, within the age population, you know, characteristics, socioeconomic status, gender, it's very important too in some things and in others it's not that important. So it all depends on the context. So the first thing that you need to do, and, and, and this is not kind of a, um, a campaign kind of presentation, the campaign has many phases. So we are now in the message phase. But before you get into the message phase, there's a lot of phases before that you should know. You should know what your goals are, you know. For instance, for the colonoscopy one, do I want, um, I increase colonoscopy rates more among people 50 age of old, or older, so let's see now the rates are, I don't know, the compliance rate are 10%, I have no idea. And I want to convert those to 20%. Or I want to convert uh, those double for people who are 60 or over, which the risk is higher, I don't know. So you have to have some kind of goals. And then you go and analyze your um, audience and understand why they're not doing it and know it. Because if, if it turns out that they're not doing it because most, most people think that their insurance won't cover it, then that's one kind of campaign that you need to do. It's not that you need to convince them to do it, it's just you need to uh, convince them that your uh, insurance actually does cover it or what you can do to make it so that it covers it. If they're not doing it because <laughs> You know, I don't want anyone messing up with my thing. You know, that, that's another type of message. So it, you have to analyze the audience before you can, you know, do a message. And that's why also many times companies have gone already because people just say, let's do this. You know, it's a good idea. And maybe, you know, it doesn't apply to the audience. And so, you know, what you, it's like trying to, you know, cure um, cancer with a Band-Aid. You know, it's not going to happen. So, it, it all depends on, on your context, on your audience, on your goals. And so when you have established that and you say, okay, I want to make people go and um, get screened, okay, and the, the problem is that they are scared, so here's how my message, how I'm going to do my message. And so when you do that, you have to take into account the things that can go wrong. So reactants can happen to anyone, but it's most likely in teens. But how many times have you, you know, somebody has forbidden something to you and you said, no. It's like, now I'm going to do it, you know? Are you married? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Commodity evaluation. So that happens when it's kind of, many of these can be confused or kind of similar. Um, commodity evaluation is um, when you start valuing something that you can't have. So it's not about freedom. It's not about the freedom to do it. It's, it's typically when you, you know, typically when you say we're gonna save now. So we're gonna try to not buy dessert for a month. You know, and then you create dessert more than ever, you know? So it's this kind of psychological uh, tendency to just, you know, value something more when you are told you can't have it. Um, ironic process theory is the elephant in the room. So don't think about the elephant in the room and then you think about the elephant. Now, let's back up a little bit. How many of you remember some of the tobacco campaigns that say, um, don't think, oh, don't smoke, think, sorry. Don't smoke, think. Remember that? No? First of all, the don't smoke clearly reacts, right? Don't do something. Um, second, who was behind that campaign? The tobacco companies. The tobacco companies because of the, um, I, I don't know, no, that was the settlement was in 98, but since uh, there were some, you know, I'm blinking on the years, that must be, oh, uh, 60s or 70s, or I don't remember that there was some evidence that smoking was bad for you. So they say, okay, you can advertise smoking, you know, but we, for, for each ad, I think that you put, you're gonna have to pay for three ads of anti-smoking. Mm -hmm. What they found out was that that was not good for them. So even though they were promoting smoking, the anti-ones were 
putting smoking out of business. So they decided altogether not to do any ads, so there wouldn't be any anti-smoking ads. But also there was so much um, propaganda and information against the tobacco companies that then they decided you have to dedicate some of your money, some of your profits, into uh, sort of a blue service, many not promoting smoking. What happens is that many of their ads actually make people smoke more than otherwise because they know all this. And so they design their ads so that they go mine. So the don't smoke thing is a perfect example. You know, hey, we're, we're telling you not to smoke, we're smoking that. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So they know this. So we should too. So these are all um, activated activation of the intended constructs. Now, when the unintended construct is activation, activated, we have observational learning. So, for instance, we see the ad and um, uh, we want to eat, or we see um, we see uh, that person who is seen and is taking drugs, and they say, "Don't take drugs." And you see the person like, "I want to eat too," you know, maybe I take some drugs. Um, so priming is when you see some, I mean, these are very similar. So the difference are very, very, very subtle. Priming, what is priming? Communication is what? That's where you kind of put people in um, kind of like a, a state of mind. So where they're already kind of in a state of mind and it activates um, kind of like what's already going through their mind. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So it's an activation of a construct that you already have. And it's bringing it forward, right? So it's nothing new. Nothing new is bringing it forward in your mind. Um, we have social cognitive theory, uh, which is a little bit like kind of social norms. You know, I'm, I think everybody's doing it, so I should do it too. Because you know, you say anti-smoking is that because a lot of people is doing it, so maybe I should do it. Should do it. Do it like everybody else is doing. Um, Peripheral processing is the processing that in which we process, I'm just going to point fast because I think my time is going out. It's processing uh, peripherally, means not thinking through things. So this is based on dual processing, processing theories in which we uh, can either think about things, so uh, uh, process centrally or, or process peripherally. And there's two kinds of views, there's the, the central, peripheral, and um, systematic heuristic. So these are both dual processing theories in which we don't think, which is big shortcuts. Um, so these are all unintended constructs, and these are intended constructs. So these are all the things that you have to take into account when you build a message. So for instance, here, you have some food facts, right? And you want people to eat right. But look at that, big burger, fries. And you say, no, don't eat that. This is bad. Right? What happens? It looks really good. You want to eat it? Actually, it looks pretty gross. You don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> I like the beans. The fries are really good. Yeah, I want the burger and the fries. Yeah, the beans are kind of hot. The is what? Intended or unintended? Unintended, right? Because you want them to focus on the good stuff. You want, Actually, you want them to focus on the, on the, which you can't read, on the text. But be where images are always more powerful than words. You know, I want to uh, put, uh, put show you a video in which I'm telling you, you know, do this. I'm, I'm telling you some instructions to do this. You know, I, I think I'm telling you to do this, but I'm doing that, and everybody's doing that. <laughs> right? Because yes. we don't, you know, if we have an image, we're not going to be, we're not going to process. That's how we are. We're cognitive mindsers. We don't want to think, you know? Yes. <laughs> so, um, images are all. So be very, very, very careful. So here is kind of the, um, the diagram of things that can happen when you have a message. And this is from Bernard Howe, now it comes to the reference, in which they kind of made sense, because all these tendencies, all these effects are being documented, they didn't uh, sort of label any of those, they just made sense of those. So you have a strategic me message, and then there's some kind of processing in your, ha in your hands. And then you can either process the intended or the unintended. If you process the unintended, most likely something's going to go wrong. Either no effects or boomerang. If you process the intended, 
you know, there's a chance that you might end up doing what the designers of the message intended you to do. Bingo. Or not, or boomerang. Yes? Isn't it likely that you're doing, I mean, with many messages, you might be doing both things at the same time, that there are competitions? Yes, uh, yes, yes. So many times, um, there's more than one message, you know, for, um, for a certain, for a gift. So sometimes campaigns have more than one message. Uh, and yes, some of them might be good, some of them might be better. Some of them, uh, because efficacy is very important, especially in now, because you want to make people sure that they can do it. So you want to motivate them that they have the ability to do it. Uh, so some message touch on that, right? Some message touch on the consequences. So a good campaign would have different elements that touch on everything. I, I guess the question wasn't whether or not a campaign would have all the messages, but what I'm asking you is, the way that you divide this up is that in my cognitive processing, I choose one path oh, or the other. Oh, correct. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But really, it's it's all like there's competition yes, happening, right? Yes. It's like a dualism. That's absolutely. Yeah, okay. absolutely. It's not that you want to choose a path that's the only thing that can happen. You know, two or three things can happen at the same time. One can uh, way more than the others. And it depends on, on you, on your personality, on your, how you process, and it also depends on how well the message is designed. And so you can see of the five possible outcomes, only one is what we want it to. So in other words, it's more likely that things go wrong than they go right. So that's why you have to be very careful. And also, which I don't know if you guys are going to have time to do, is pilot, 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 pilot. And see if it works. If it works, then go full-fledged or go in, in phases. If you don't pilot and you go full-fledged and it goes wrong, you know, you wanted to do things better and now you're doing things worse. So pilot, 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 pilot. So here we see reactants, and here we see a boomerang. So uh, in terms of uh, getting human use approval for doing this kind of work, then you have to say this is a possibility, could boomerang and people would start smoking twice as much. So these are the things that the IRB wants to know, Yes. right? And the NIH. Yeah, and the NIH. The NIH always has a section where what are the possible um, issues, like what are the, for example, if someone takes more inhaled steroids, they could get oral thrush, because now you're using the medicine, you could get thrush. Right. So all of these unintended potential consequences, they want to see in the NIH application under human subjects. And for instance, this one is one of them that you also probably should tell uh, participants, you know, with this one thing that can happen. I was just wondering how you, how do you deal with this when you don't know yeah, well, what's going to happen? Yeah, well, you pilot. But before piloting, you also need IRB approval. So um, then you see I force given in the past research, in the past um, campaigns, you know, this is a possibility when we're trying to, um, for instance, look at one of the burger we is not going to show any burgers, we're only going to show really healthy foods or, you know, uh, for some people, that might be the case, so we're going to have a, a, a screening test in which high sensation seekers. Sensation seekers is kind of one of those labels in psychology in which, you know, you take a test and then they classify you whether you're a sensation seeker or not. These are people who take risks in life. So these are the guys who jump off, you know, a plane with a parachute or they climb, you know, these are the guys who get, you know, their, their adrenaline from doing things that are risky. And these people tend to always sometimes put things up in our research because they, um, you know, they say, you know, you might see, you know, a guy smoking or, you know, the drug, I'm just making it up over there. So they see the drug one, it's like, cool. I wonder if I can go parent a little bit of drug here. So these are people who you kind of want to avoid maybe it happen. So one thing to avoid is have to have a screening test mm -hmm. in which you ask them questions. And so you're a high sensation because, sorry, you can't be a participant. So there's different ways in which you can, um, you know, kind of avoid these secondary effects. But, you know, they might want to know that. But these are harder than, for instance, an effect in which, you know, you know, you have documented that if you do this, you know, it might, it might happen. But it still is behavioral because, you know, nobody, it, it's not that the medicine is going to be bad for you, it's the bad use of the medicine that's going to be bad for you. So these are always harder. It's much easier to do, um, I don't know, drug trials. Because you know exactly, you've done it first in rats, I think, and then you do it in humans, and everything is controlled. And I'm giving you 
200 milligrams of babies, you know, how can I give you 200 milligrams of fever? Mm -hmm. You know? And, you know, how do you measure 200 milligrams of fever? You just can't. But does so the IRB give you a hard time? Huh? I wouldn't think these would be hard to get through an IRB, though, compared since all of industry is doing it without an IRB. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, sometimes sometimes they're very uh, picky on the, on the side effects and on the risks. Especially if there's deception, which if you do an experiment, there's always deception because otherwise it's no fun. Right? If you tell them, you know, I'm going to show you a real piece of news, you know, no, most of the things, most of the times when you do when you test on the effect of news or ads, these are made up, right? Because you want to manipulate them. And there's nothing in real life that's comparable. So you take an app, make it up, and in one case you say games, and the other case you say losses, and you make it up. But you're going to tell the guys that this is an ad that appeared on CBS. Because otherwise, if you say, no, this is an ad that I made up, you know, they're not going to process it. So there has to be some deception. Um, and so that's when they start being, you know, deception, you know. Okay. So things to take home. Um, the message are designed to change awareness, attitudes, and behaviors. And some of the persuasion tools that we've seen today is balance framing and emotions. There's more. This is just a little flavor of it. There's many, many more. And we know that these things uh, can go wrong. We might have no effects, which is like sand, or worse, boomerang, in which, you know, people end up doing more of what you didn't want them to do. And that can be problematic. So, what should you do? Turn processing resources toward intended constructs and avoid unintended elements such as this, you know. It's all healthy stuff. The snow, burgers, fries, or so. So some of the things to get home. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know if there's any more questions. You know, in terms of Food advertising, uh -huh. speaking of overeating or trying to control weight, uh -huh. the uh, the advertisers, the companies, the food companies, go through great lengths for a food shop. They will spend thousands of dollars to get the perfect food shot to make the food look absolutely irresistible. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I was thinking that if you were trying to persuade someone to eat more healthy, then what you would do is you would go through that kind of expense or that kind of trouble to make the shot of the healthy food look so delicious. And you could have food of burgers and on a plate that's you know dirty and has ants crawling on it or something that doesn't look as desirable. You and when that. I, yes. But I don't know whether you I don't know if for instance if the lobbyists of the meat would say, you know, this is you know, you're deceiving because that's not true. You know, I one on the one hand. On the other hand people or, you know, in general, institutions or people who try to promote a good health eating typically don't have any money mm -hmm. because there's not too much money to do, yes. you know, in eating carrots. You know, what can you do to a carrot? You know, maybe flee and shred it. Julianne. But there's not much value added that you can do to it, and there's not much potential for profit. Mm -hmm. And so it just turns out that people who want to do this don't have a lot of resources, and people who um, you know, produce products that can be bad for your health has a lot of resources. Um, and so when you say spending a lot of thousands of dollars to get that perfect image, well, they might not have the resources. Um, and in behavioral too, you know, there's no money to be made on behavioral. You know, get people to exercise more. While there is money to be made, you know, for the gear, you can like make it into the gear. Uh, but drugs, there's a lot of money to be made on drugs, you know? A lot, a lot, a lot of money, and so, you know, that's why the ads are so strong. But, you know, that's just how, that's just how it works, unfortunately. Um, and not only that they have a lot of money, but they have a lot of power in Congress. Yes. And so, one of the things, and I think that's from Michael Pollan's book, that was, um, is it with Michael Pollan? No? This is the guy who um, is, I think he's a, Professor in communication, I think. I think he's in communication, and so he's just very appalled at why people eat so badly in this country. And so he has 
written a couple of books. He wrote a book into the history of bee from the moment, you know, from the cow to the plate. And so, and he's the one who say, well, a burger that really had come from thousands of different calves. And you have no ways to trace it. So when there is one of these pandemics, it's just like, where did it come from? Because you have these massive um, industries that have cows <coughs> like plants in there, and then they mix everything in there. And so by the time you get it on the plate, there's no way you can trace it. And so that was one of his books. And then um, the last one, in which I think there's a letters on the cover, and I'm blinking on the, uh, what? Just food. No, not just food, but something of the something of food. Um, in which he's talking about, you know, what's going on with 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 the food choices in the U.S. You know, and why there is why something that is highly processed, you know, has to be cheaper than an avocado or a broccoli. And why in some ladies that they say natural change, you look and it's full of really bad things, like they eat something and stabilizers and stuff. And why do they have a, a, a label that says natural? The organic label is very regulated. You can only say that's organic if it truly is organic. It has to be certified organic, and your fields have to be uh, pesticide and fertilizer. Well, I don't know fertilizer, but you know, chemicals can be go three or five years. Super regulated, but the natural. The label that says natural, it's not really that. You can call anything natural. Mm -hmm. And so um, so one of the things that he said is that, I think in, 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 the, I think in the 60s, there were some studies that showed that eating beef was not good for you. Eating a lot of beef is not good for you. And so they came up with the campaigns that say, eat less beef. What happened? The big beef productors say, uh-uh, this ain't gonna happen. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to put our industry in jeopardy? No way. So let's find another way. And I think the other way, if I'm not if I'm correct, is eat more chicken. Right? Eat more chicken. It doesn't say anything about beef. Right? So we don't touch our industry. Don't touch my industry. And it promotes the, the, the what's it called? Uh, poultry. The poultry industry. Right? So it's a win-win for everyone. So this is how many times, I think it was in the 60s, now imagine, with less regulation, you know. So there's a study that shows that something isn't good for you and you can't even promote it because you have the industry behind you that says, no way, you're not going to touch your profits. So it's hard.